Okay, in our video series of Neurology Lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about vertigo. We are going to discuss the presentation, the causes, the types and the treatment of vertigo in detail. Vertigo is basically a false sensation of motion, false sensation of spinning or swaying caused by dysfunction of either the inner ear that is called as peripheral vertigo or the central vestibular system that is called as central vertigo while the person is stationary the patient is stationary patient is at rest and the patient thinks that the surrounding is moving surrounding is in motion and the patient is at rest that sensation that false sense of motion false sense of spinning and swaying is called as vertigo now normally the sense of balance is maintained by the brain and the brain receives signals from the inner ear vestibular system. In the inner ear, there is a vestibular system and that vestibular system detects that whether the person is at rest or the person is in motion. And that vestibular system tells the brain that the person is at rest now. And when the person is driving, the inner ear will tell the brain that the person is in motion now. But if there is any problem with the inner ear and inner ear gets any disease in which it starts sending wrong signals to the brain, it tells the brain that the person is in motion while the person is at rest. That causes a sensation of vertigo where the brain gets confused because the body is at rest and brain is thinking that the things are moving that causes vertigo. And if there is problem with the inner ear that is called as peripheral vertigo. In some cases, what happens is that there is a problem with the brain. The ear is functioning normally, but the brain is perceiving wrong signals. And brain thinks that the surrounding is moving while everything is stationary. That is called as central vertigo. Now, there are a certain terms that must not be confused with vertigo. Patients will tell you that they are feeling dizzy, lightheaded or pre-syncope. You need to actually see that what does the patient want to say whether the patient is suffering from vertigo or the patient is suffering from dizziness or presyncope. In dizziness or presyncope there is usually orthostatic hypotension and patient gets lowering of blood pressure and all of a sudden they feel light headed they may fall on the floor they may uh, lose consciousness for a few seconds and when they regain consciousness they are totally okay. That is a different thing that is presyncope, light headedness, dizziness. In the sensation of a vertigo, patient will feel that the surrounding is moving. That is the sensation of vertigo. Now, as I said, vertigo can have central causes in which the brain is perceiving the wrong signals. Or it can be peripheral in which there are problems with the inner ear and inner ear is sending the wrong signals. In central causes, we can have cerebellar strokes or tumors vestibular nucleus region vestibular nucleus is the nucleus that is present in the brain and it is receiving signals from the inner ear that whether the person is at rest or in motion migraine headache multiple sclerosis i have made separate videos on each of these topics you can check out the link of those videos in the description in the peripheral causes we have vestibular neuritis benign paroxysmal positional vertigo meniere's disease aminoglycoside toxicity now we'll discuss each one of these peripheral causes in detail Whenever a patient comes to you and patient tells you the doctor I am feeling dizzy or I am having vertigo or I am having presyncope or lightheadedness, you must always differentiate that what does that patient means by the word dizziness. Whether the patient is having sensation of vertigo or the patient is having sensation of dizziness or lightheadedness. If the patient feels blackout, lightheaded with chest pain or shortness of breath, usually it's the orthostatic hypotension that is causing the blackout, that is causing the presyncope, that is causing the lightheadedness. And it is presyncope, it is not vertigo. And if the patient tells you that I feel that the room is spinning, or I get an unsteady feeling that I am about to fall because something is in motion, that is vertigo. Now, when you have diagnosed that this patient is suffering from vertigo, now you need to see that whether that patient is having any neurological findings or not. What neurological signs can be there? Patient might be having weakness of one side of the body. Patient might be having diplopia. 
patient might be having dysphagia, patient might be having dysmetria in which there are uncoordinated movements of the body, abnormal gait. Now, these neurological findings point out that the problem is not in the ear, the problem is in the brain. There is something wrong in the central part and usually this is, this indicates to central vertigo and central vertigo is more concerning than peripheral vertigo. Central vertigo is worrisome, peripheral vertigo is not worrisome. And the central vertigo is really associated with no tinnitus or, and no hearing loss because nothing is wrong with the ear, something is wrong with the brain. That is the central vertigo. If you think that the patient is having central vertigo, then the next step is that you do MRI. You do posterior fossa MRI and you want to look at the lesions because I, as I said that these patients might be having a cerebellar stroke. These patients might be having a cerebellar tumor and you need to see the cerebellum in the posterior fossa for which you need to go for an MRI. If the neurological exam is normal, patient is not having any neurological deficit or if the patient is having tinnitus present or if the patient has hearing loss present, it means that the problem is not with the brain, problem is with the ear. There is something wrong in the inner ear, therefore patient is having tinnitus, ringing sensation in the ear, hearing loss is usually present. That is not worrisome, that is a bit reassuring in the sense that peripheral causes are mild, peripheral causes can easily be treated, the central causes are more concerning. So in the absence of any neurological findings and in the presence of tinnitus and hearing loss, it is most likely a peripheral vertigo. So that's how you approach a patient with vertigo. Now remember an important point, remember the dangerous D's, if these dangerous D's are there, they point out toward the central cause, if the patient is having dysphagia, if the patient is having dysarthria, problem with the speech, diplopia, dysmetria, abnormal movement, incoordinated, imbalanced movements, they point out toward the central causes. So look out for the dangerous D's whenever the patient presents to you with vertigo. Now coming to the comparison of central vertigo and peripheral vertigo. In the peripheral vertigo, cranial nerve palsies will be absent. There will be no findings in the cranial nerves because everything is okay with the brain. Everything is normal in the cranial nerves. But in central vertigo, cranial nerve palsies will be present. Cerebellar signs will be present. Cerebellum will be involved. Therefore, you will see dysmetria, incoordinated movements, dysphagia, dysarthria, impaired speech, diplopia, the dangerous these will be there and the cerebellar signs also include ataxia so these findings point out toward a central vertigo hearing loss and tinnitus will be present in peripheral causes because the thing is wrong with the ear so the ear will present with hearing loss and tinnitus ringing sensation in the ear and central vertigo usually the tinnitus and hearing loss is absent but in some rare cases you might find tinnitus as well now coming to nystagmus, remember if the nystagmus is unidirectional and horizontal, it is reassuring because it is most likely peripheral cause and peripheral cause can be treated easily. So if it is unidirectional and frequently horizontal nystagmus, it points out towards the peripheral cause. But if the nystagmus is vertical or torsional, this points out, this is highly suggestive of the central cause. Vertical or torsional nystagmus is highly suggestive of a central cause. That is called as beat down nystagmus where there will be a vertical nystagmus. Now a simple examination test that you can perform to differentiate that whether that patient is having peripheral nystagmus or central cause of nystagmus is the head impulse test. What you do in head impulse test is that you ask the patient to focus on a single point in the room and you hold the patient head like this and you slightly move the patient head and you keep looking at the eyes of the patient and then you suddenly give the jerk and you look at the nystagmus in the eyes then you keep moving the head slowly and gradually you keep moving the head and you suddenly give the jerk and you see the eyes if there is nystagmus present after the sudden jerk that shows that the cause is peripheral if the head impulse test shows nystagmus and that nystagmus appears after this impulse after the sudden jerk that shows the cause is peripheral and if there is no nystagmus on sudden jerk or if there is no change in nystagmus after the sudden jerk, 
that shows the cause is central. So an abnormal head impulse test shows that the cause is peripheral. A normal head impulse test is actually concerning. That shows that the cause is central. Now in the peripheral vertigo, the sense of swaying and spinning will be severe. In central vertigo, the sense of swaying and spinning will be mild. Sensation of nausea and vomiting will be severe in peripheral vertigo. These patients will be having vomiting. These patients will be having severe nausea. And in central vertigo, the sensation of nausea and vomiting varies. It can be mild, it can be moderate, it can be severe. Now, I'll explain the three most important causes of peripheral vertigo, vestibular neuritis, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and Meniere's disease. First, coming to vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis. These are the two common conditions that cause vertigo. Vestibular neuritis. Vestibular neuritis is the inflammation of the vestibular nerve. Vestibular nerve is the nerve that carries information from the inner ear to the vestibular nucleus to the brain. Inflammation of vestibular nerve usually occurs when the patient had an upper respiratory tract infection and after that patient recovered from the upper respiratory tract infection and patient develops sense of rotation, sense of vertigo, sense of spinning of the environment. That is a classical scenario. Patient had an upper respiratory tract infection after which the patient developed sense of vertigo. That is vestibular neuritis. What is labyrinthitis? The cochlea, the semicircular canals, that is called as the labyrinth of inner ear. And after respiratory tract infection, usually that bony labyrinth, that uh, membranous labyrinth, that cochlea, that semicircular canal, they get inflamed and they send wrong signals to the brain. That is called as labyrinthitis. And it also occurs after upper respiratory tract infection. There is usually a history of recent upper respiratory tract infection and how to differentiate that whether the patient is suffering from vestibular neuritis or the patient is suffering from labyrinthitis. If the hearing loss is present, that points out towards labyrinthitis. Basically, the labyrinth is involved, the cochlea is involved in labyrinthitis. That results in hearing loss. But in vestibular neuritis, the cochlea is spared, the nerve is inflamed. So, hearing loss is usually absent in vestibular neuritis. So, that's how you differentiate between the two and it's the most common cause of vertigo in patients. Now remember, vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis are self-resolving. They will go away by themselves. But for symptomatic management, you can give a beta histine 8 mg that comes with the name of CERC. Or you can give prochlorperazine 5 mg that comes with the name of stematil. But remember, these are self-resolving. They will take almost a few days after which the patient will be totally fine. Now coming to benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo as its name implies it's a benign condition, it's a peripheral vertigo and it is positional vertigo. Whenever the patient changes the position, when the patient is lying down in the bed and the patient sits up, a patient gets the sensation of spinning or when the patient is sitting up and the patient lies down, patient will get a few seconds of sensation of extreme spinning and swaying that is called as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now in the inner ear, we have the cochlea and the semicircular canals and within these semicircular canals, we have these small stones called as autoconia. These autoconias are basically lying in the inner ear and they detect the motion that whether the person is moving or the person is at rest, whether the patient is moving in a lift a vertical motion or whether the patient is moving in a bus a horizontal motion but sometimes these autoconias these stone get dislodged from their original place and they start moving in the semicircular canals and when they start moving in the semicircular canals they will start send wrong signals to the brain and brain will think that the patient is moving and it usually occurs when the patient is changing the position when you are sitting and you start lying down when you change the position these stones will move and they will result in abnormal signaling and for few seconds the patient will get severe sensation of swinging and spinning. That is called as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It is episodic, it is for few seconds and it is triggered by movement, especially on lying down. Duration is for few seconds, for less than 90 seconds. When the patient maintains a certain position, those stones get stable and the patient is totally okay. There is usually vertical torsional nystagmus associated with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. There is usually a vertical torsional nystagmus when the patient changes the position. Nystagmus also appears on changing the position and that is a vertical torsional nystagmus. 
and the diagnosis of benign proximal positional vertigo is made by certain maneuvers called as dix halpike maneuver what you do in this dix halpike maneuver is that you change the position of the patient and you dislodge those autoconias and you want to see that whether that patient has nystagmus with that or not that is called as dix halpike maneuver in dix halpike maneuver what you do is that you dislodge those autoconias and you induce nystagmus and then there is another maneuver for the treatment so the uh, diagnosis is with the maneuvers the treatment is also with the maneuvers in the Eppler's maneuver what you do is that you position the patient in such a way that those autogonias those stone get back to their original position and they don't get dislodged so that is the uh, treatment of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo you can search the videos of these maneuvers on youtube now coming to Meniere's disease, in Meniere's disease it is a peripheral vertigo cause and the problem is within the inner ear. In the inner ear we have cochlea, we have semicircular canals and in the semicircular canals and the cochlea we have production of a certain amount of fluid. That fluid is present in these semicircular canals and cochlea and that fluid keeps moving and gives the brain a sensation of movement. But in Meniere's disease the amount of fluid increases the amount of fluid is in excess and that causes problem either the over, there is overproduction of the fluid or there is under drainage of the fluid but the amount of fluid increases it puts pressure on the receptors and it causes vertigo that is Meniere's disease the classical mnemonic for this is DVT there is deafness due to excess accumulation of fluid there is vertigo due to abnormal stimulation of the receptors and there will be tinnitus because the problem is in the inner ear there will be bringing sensation there will be abnormal stimulation of the ear due to excess fluid present in it the duration of the vertigo will be for 20 minutes to even 12 hours so it will persist for a longer period of time in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo the vertigo appears on changing the position and it will be there for a few seconds but in Meniere's disease it is not related with changing position the patient is having vertigo for a longer period of time from 20 minutes to 12 hours and the treatment includes vestibular suppressants vertibular suppressants like first generation antihistamines benzodiazepines anti-emetics because nausea is also associated with these and anti-emetics are also very good vestibular suppressants that suppress the vestibular system and decrease the sense of motion with that you also advise the patient to have low salt diet you ask the patient to stop smoking stress reduction and diuretics like thiazides are given to drain this excess fluid out from the body now coming to some important drugs that are used for the symptomatic management of acute vertigo in for the treatment of acute vertigo vestibular suppressants are given antihistamines or vestibular suppressants but they are weak vestibular suppressants antihistamines include diphenhydrinate diphenhydramine meclizine benzodiazepines are strong vestibular suppressants but remember they have addiction potential benzodiazepines include alprazolam clonazepam diazepam lorazepam benzodiazepines should not be used for more than two to three days for acute vertigo treatment the doses are given with them antiemetics are also vestibular suppressants and antiemetics include metoclopramide odensitron prochlorperazine that comes with the name of stimetyl promethazine Drugs that can be given IV for acute emergency ward use include antihistamines like diphenhydramine, dimenhydrinate, they cause sedation, antiemetics like metoclopramide, odensitron, prochlorperazine. So these are the commonly used drugs for the symptomatic management of acute vertigo. Before going into the summary of the video, if you like my video, please click on the subscribe button. We talked about what is vertigo. The central causes, peripheral causes of vertigo, approach to a patient with vertigo, the dangerous D's, the difference between peripheral and central vertigo, what is vestibular neuritis and how do you manage it, what is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, Meniere's disease and its management and at the end we discuss the commonly used drugs for the symptomatic management of acute vertigo. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on emergency medicine and neurology lectures. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.